welcome to the Heart of Dating podcast. Hey, it's Kate. I'm so glad you could join us this week as we try to entangle the ever so ambiguous world of dating as a Christian. Over here on Heart of Dating, we get real as we answer some tough questions and uncover transformative ways to approach Christian dating. Oh, and you better believe we have some laughs along the way, because last time I checked, the struggle is hashtag real. You know what I'm saying? Now, let's get to the heart of the matter. Hey guys, welcome back to season 10 of the Heart of Dating podcast, where we are covering all things related to sex and sexuality from the lens of being a Christian single. If you didn't already know, our primary mission in this season is to debunk myths surrounding sex expectations and healthy, godly sexual ethic as a single, as we also address the roots of unhealthy sexual ethic and dive into nuanced topics like porn, lust, attraction, newlywed sex, all of these things all within a biblical lens. Now, last week we had my very best friends in the whole world, Nika and Emeka Ahedabo on to share the truths about sex on your wedding night. And you guys, that episode was so good. Let me tell you a little bit of why, because we talked so much more than just sex on your wedding night. We tackled anxiety and fear that may lead up to having sex for the first time or having sex again after having a past that was really traumatic in the area of sex. We also talk about the reality that some people don't have sex on their wedding night or even for the first few weeks because of pain that's involved or trauma surrounding sex. We also debunk the myth and really this belief system that sex is only for male pleasure and that women should have sex with their husbands even if they don't want to just to please their husbands. This is something so horrible and actually perpetuates more abuse. So listen to last week's episode to really find out about all of these things. Plus, Nika and Emeka are our best friends in the whole world and we just had so much fun with them. I can't believe that was their first time on the show. Now today, I am so excited because of course, we have another incredible conversation for you. This one is with Dr. Julie Slattery, who is incredibly passionate about God's design for sex and sexuality. In fact, two weeks ago when we had Gary Thomas on the show, you'll hear that if you listen to that episode, he actually referenced Dr. Julie Slattery multiple times, which I was so thrilled about because I knew that we were going to have this episode with Julie on the show as well. Let me tell you about Dr. Julie. Dr. Julie Sodery is a clinical psychologist, author, speaker, and the president and co-founder of Authentic Intimacy, a ministry devoted to reclaiming God's design for sexuality. She is the author of 10 books and host of the weekly podcast, Java with Julie. Julie and her husband, Mike, are the parents of three sons, and they live in Akron, Ohio. Now, quick disclaimer before we go into this ultimate sex talk Q&A, which is answering all of your biggest questions regarding sex, okay? This conversation was actually recorded two years ago in early 2021, and it was actually featured at the Singled Out Heart of Dating virtual conference. So with that being said, you may hear in this interview to some references that are not accurate in terms of the date or timing of things, right? You actually may hear me say, I've been doing Heart of Dating for three years, when actually today I've been doing Heart of Dating for five years. So I just want to say that quick disclaimer that this was actually recorded two years ago. However, the content in this episode is so phenomenal. We talk about so many things, purity culture, the damage of purity culture, how to heal from that, what to do when you have this sexual desire. What do you do with that as a single if you are remaining abstinent till marriage? What about masturbation and the struggles with masturbation? We talk about so many things, pretty much every burning question that you have, we answer today with Dr. Julie. So I'm so excited for this episode. You guys are going to love it. She is so rich in wisdom. Without further ado, let's get into this episode today with Dr. Julie Slattery. You know, we're talking about sex today. So I've been just so looking forward to it. And on top of that, we did a poll in our Heart of Dating dating audience to really find out what their pain points were. And uh, I knew that there was a lot under the surface here, you know, working in the space of dating. But I think doing that poll and seeing the questions made my mind go, wow, there is even more layers here to uncover um, and things to talk about than I even 
anticipate it. So thank you for coming today. <laughs> yeah, I know it is a pain point, I think for singles, I think even for married people, it's just yes. one of those topics that there's so much confusion about and the conversation just keeps getting more and more difficult. And unfortunately, a lot of Christian sources are just silent on some of yes. the most pressing issues. Oh my gosh. That yes, absolutely. Um, so Julie, you are first before I get into some of the other introductory questions, when I did pull the audience and I was like, hey, what would you want to hear from a sexologist or a Christian sex therapist? They were like, What is that? I've never heard of that. So would you explain a little what it is that you do? And, and then also like how you got into even talking to singles through this process. Sure. Well, I probably would never identify find myself as a sexologist or sex therapist, although people call me all kinds of things. <laughs> but uh, but a, a sex therapist is somebody who's certified in sex therapy. Um, mm. And so that's a real specialty. And I haven't gone through that that certification process, but yeah. I'm, a I'm a clinical psychologist by training. Mm. And so yeah. I have a lot of that underlying training and then uh, have just been in the space of Christian a living and women's issues and marriage and things like that for really my whole adult life. Yeah. And then uh, in 2012, just had this real sense of God calling me specifically into talking solely about mm. sexuality, which wow. was not something I would have signed up for. It was um, <laughs> kind of like, okay, Lord, are you sure you want me to do this? Um, yeah. But yeah, so my job is really the integration of uh, the Bible and what it says about sex, along with my training as a psychologist, and then combining that with just real life issues uh, that people yeah. are facing and questions they're asking. So my work is kind of this, this combination of integrating those three things together. And it's really been fulfilling and challenging. And uh, I wake up every day excited about kind of what the next challenge is going to be. I love that. I love that you said it's definitely not something in 2012 that you saw yourself doing because a few years ago, I said the same thing. I never thought as a single woman, I would step into the space of dating, dating coaching, being a dating expert. I mean, if you told me that five years ago, it's been three years now, I would I la I would have laughed. Like I would have yeah. truly <laughs> thought like that is the biggest hoax ever that will never happen. And so it's just, and here we are, Julie, here we are, but we both, it's something we love. So clearly God has given us the passion in our hearts to serve people in these unique ways. Um, and I understand it that you, when you started your ministry, you really at first started primarily talking to marrieds and couples. And so how did that kind of change? I would love to know. Yeah, I think if you look back at that time, 2012, a lot of what the church would say about sex, and they didn't say a lot, but it was for married people. <laughs> and so yeah. there might be a class for newlyweds or premarital counseling uh, or a sermon every now and then on the Song of Solomon about sex and marriage. Like once a year. <laughs> yes, I, or once a decade. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So when we set out, we really had that, okay, like married women really need help with this. Mm -hmm. And it very quickly evolved into whenever I'd go speak at a church, single women were like, well, why can't we come? And I'm like, well, you can come. Yeah, we'd love to have you. And that got me thinking like single women are sexual too. And mm -hmm. they're asking some of the same questions that married women are asking and they're asking some different questions. So I would, I would say it only took me about three or four months to recognize that this conversation is for everyone. And that's mm -hmm. one of the, the mistakes I think we've made in the past is we've kind of said, all right, even if you're a grown adult, like you're not allowed to hear this, we're going to put you in this room while we have this adult conversation about sex. And so uh, we need to have uh, an understanding of mm. what the Bible says about sex and how to walk that out. It doesn't matter how old you are, whether you're single, yeah. married, divorced, this is a critical conversation for everybody to be having. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I could not agree with you more. And by the, the seeing that our audience's response, both females and men, they're definitely, they definitely agree. It definitely proves that to be true. As you know, now that you've been doing this for almost, I guess, nine years in this specific area. Now you also talk, Julie, a lot about paradigm shifts and, um, 
like the paradigm shifts that Christians need to have when they're thinking about their sexuality. So we are going to go into a lot of the practical questions like from our audience specifically. So you guys listening, these are questions that you guys ask that Julie's going to answer. It's really exciting. But before we get into all that, I'd love to hear you just talk a little bit about the importance of kind of paradigm shifts and when we're thinking about our sexuality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one thing I noticed, Kate, after several years of ministering in this arena was that we didn't just need more of the same. Uh, Mm -hmm. We we didn't need to turn up the volume on what people, Christians were saying about sex, because some of it was really not the right message or is the right message that was framed in a way that wasn't helpful or was too simplistic. And so I began probably about three or four years ago saying, Uh, We don't need to just address what are we saying about sex. We need to also address how we're even approaching the topic, which is more of a paradigm shift. And so I started just teaching at um, churches and and college campuses and ministries some of the paradigm shifts that we need to make. And, uh, Mm. you know, like one of them, for example, is a paradigm shift that we're all sexually broken, that there's not one person on the planet that perfectly understands and embraces God's design for sex. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so whether you've stayed pure until you get married, you've never had sex, you've done it quote unquote right. There's still brokenness in your thinking and your heart mm. and your life around sexuality. And mm. I think a paradigm shift like that is so key because it, it tears down the walls in these conversation uh, and yeah. it really integrates the larger message of Jesus into these conversations that we all need to come to him for healing and for restoration. It's not just the people that can identify with a certain failure in the past or a certain struggle in the present. Uh, so mm-hmm. that's one of them. I think that's my so heart is to teach people not what to think about sex, but how to think about sex. Mm. And to how to wrestle through and understand the context for your sexual desire and your sexual shame and how to think about the questions about how far should a dating relationship go physically and uh, what do we do if we've messed up? Uh, Like Mm. you can have somebody tell you, here's five steps, but it's more important to train us in thinking in a way that's reflective of God's heart and his word. And so um, that's the big paradigm shift that I'm most excited about. Yeah, that's so good, Julia. So many times when people come to me and they're like, Kate, tell me what physical boundaries I should have. Or Kate, tell me, you know, they want like this prescribed set of rules and a system. And I understand in in one sense, I get the question. I get that. Like this is, it it can feel very gray, but I am like, I'm not going to sit here and tell you exactly step by step there. First of all, let's break it down. Not even to sexuality. There isn't a step-by-step process, even to dating. That is such a gray area. That's why I have so many conversations because you could meet someone and know instantly you're going to marry them. You could also meet someone and and really not think that's your person for many months, but God grows your heart towards them. So those are two different situations that I can't give you a formula. There is no formula. And so with sexuality, it's kind of similar with boundaries and people are so desperate. But I think that some one reason they're so desperate is because they've been taught that there needs to be this prescribed set of rules. um, And therefore, they're like grasping for that specific set of rules. Um, and without a deep understanding of the the why of the design and everything that we're going to talk about today, it makes it so that I could give you any rules in the book, but if you don't understand truly that depth, those rules aren't going to stick. <laughs> like, no, you know? And actually we get angry at the rules. And so yeah. uh, when maybe you're young in your faith, um, somebody will say, hey, here's some good standards to follow. And that's not bad, but it becomes yeah. legalistic to you because you're like, I, these standards don't make sense to me anymore. And my relationship mm-hmm. with this person is different. <clears throat> and so I'm not so sure that those standards fit. And then it makes us want to check the whole thing instead of yeah. really growing in our knowledge of the Lord and our understanding for his heart for us. Oh, it's so good. Okay. So we are going to transition into some of these questions and we're going to get to as many as we can. I'm going to do my best here. Um, but we, you so graciously helped me. We're separating it into a few different sections, which is going to be great. And I'm so excited because everyone asks so many questions, but I think it's a good place to start off with recognizing and understanding. Well, let me back up. A lot of the people listening 
our target audience and a lot of people listening are uh, millennials. And I won't, if you're not a millennial watching this, totally fine. Um, but there are a lot of millennials and the millennials were really hit through the purity movement. Um, I'm myself I'm smack dab in the millennial culture with, you know, I kiss dating goodbye. Don't want to just throw it on to Josh Harris for sure. Um, but there was, it was a lot. It was a, a church movement, especially during that time that really impacted people and how they viewed purity, sexuality, this, that, and the other. Uh, so I would love to start by talking about how we embrace God's design beyond the purity movement. And the first question I have uh, listed is, and this one, oh my gosh, I love it. But I'm just going in, right? We're doing it. Okay. So somebody asked, why is it okay to be turned on or horny on your wedding night, but before that it's considered lust? This is probably in, we got this question in various forms, um, but that, I mean, I'm just going to leave that there and ex let you do the wow. explaining. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think, um, <clears throat> first of all, I think it's possible to be married and to lust. Mm, um, that's good because, to know. Yeah. Because when we really think about lust, lust is this attitude of, I must have this. Mm. Uh, and I deserve wow. this. And we even see within a lot of married couples, Christian married couples, sort of that attitude of I'm married and you owe me this. And mm. uh, wow. you, I, I get to have this on my terms. And I would say that's lust um, because lust again is the attitude of taking mm. instead of having the attitude of my sexual desire and drive and sexual intimacy is entering into this celebration of a covenant promise and of love. Wow. And yeah. so I think it's possible to feel sexual desire when you're single, but for that not to turn into lust, it's just something that you have to steward and manage well. And it's very mm. possible to be married and to kind of sanctify very lustful attitudes, even towards your spouse. And so yeah. we have to get at the heart of, you know, kind of our selfish little kid inside that's demanding. Mm. And mm. that heart doesn't go away just because you get married. And it doesn't mean that you can't, again, experience sexual drives and desire without submitting those uh, to the Lord. And then they're not lustful. So I think that's an important distinction to make. So the next question that comes up with lust is here. So when does embracing my sexuality and sexual desire cross the line into sinfulness or lust as a single person specifically? Um, because that that I think that's like kind of the first note there, because wh where is that? Everyone's like, I don't. OK, but like, where's that line? You know? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, um, like I said before, it starts with really examining your heart. <laughs> So is my mm -hmm. heart that uh, I, I view my sexuality or my sexual desire as I, a must have, like I want, mm -hmm. I'm going to do whatever I can do to get that. And that's a hard issue. And Jesus was mm -hmm. all about our heart and our actions and our words are the overflow of our heart. Um, but I think part of it is recognizing that we have a choice of what we meditate on. Mm -hmm. And so you can't control the thoughts that come into your mind but you can control the thoughts that stay there. Mm, and so as a single person, or even as a married woman, if I see somebody that I'm not married to, and I notice, wow, that's a really attractive guy, or, um, you know, like I could really have feelings for that guy. I, those, I can't control those thoughts getting there, <clears throat> but I can control what I do with those thoughts, whether mm. I let them linger, whether I let them develop into fantasy, now I've crossed the line into lust. Uh, and I think the same thing applies in singleness is, hey, you're going to notice guys or girls that you think are very attractive, that you're sexually attracted to. You may feel aroused. You mm. notice that and you say, Lord, this is how I feel. Um, would you help me? I choose not to go down that road because that's not yeah. a good road for me to go down right now. Um, mm. Now, and if you're in a married relationship, if some of you transition into that, when you start to have those feelings towards your spouse, you actually want to then start dwelling on that. Like yeah. people have trouble with that. So I, wow. some of the reason I bring up marriage is because I think that it's critical for people to understand these problems don't go away when you get married. They just change form a little bit, <laughs> uh, but mm -hmm. the struggles can be very much the same even after you get married. 
Mm, okay. That's so good. I'm going to ask a question later about in relationship, like dating, how we steward this, but I'm going to wait for that because I have more questions about just the, um, just feeling comfortable in your sexuality. And then I want to go into purity culture. But so I really want people to start understanding how they can be comfortable with that sexual desire. Like you just said, if you see someone who's attractive, it's normal to have a thought of, oh, that person's attractive. Oh, that person's kind of sexy. Like I, I'm totally, I have the, I'm like, yeah. I even think about it for women, not in a way that I'm, but I'm like, that's a beautiful person, you know? And I think that's even sometimes weird for people to say. I'm like, no, I think there's plenty of women who are absolutely beautiful. Right. And I, I'm like, wow, that's a really beautiful, stunning woman, you know? And so how do we begin to feel comfortable with some of our sexuality or maybe breaking down just that sexual desire a bit more so that people can understand like what what is normal in this process and what doesn't have to be so shoved down, shamed, compartmentalized, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that I think is really helpful to think of is that your sexuality is God's way of reminding you that you weren't meant to do life alone. Um, and so it's, a, it's about a lot more than having sex with somebody. Um, yeah. Your sexuality is everything that encompasses that drive in you, that draws you to people, that helps you appreciate mm -hmm. them, that makes you want to share at a level that's very vulnerable. And yeah. I think in our culture today, we only define sexuality as having sex or having yes. a sexual expression instead yeah. of saying, hey, our sexuality, it involves our gender it involves, uh, again, moving towards people. Um, and so I think if you can see that God created hormones, you know, yeah. he created testosterone, estrogen, he designed it so that in early adulthood, now it's been moved very much into teenage, young teen years, which is a challenge. Yeah. But by his design, you should have awakened <laughs> in your body in a way that you're like, I don't want to do life alone. Like I'm not okay. Just pursuing my career. I'm mm. not okay. Just gaming all the time. Like yeah. I, I need to put down what I'm doing and pursue a person. And, uh, and I think if we can view our sexual drive in a good way, that way, mm. that, uh, that it's what forces us to want to take risks and mm. risk rejection and risk yeah. being vulnerable because there's this innate drive uh, to eventually like bond with somebody. And that's mm. a good thing, but any good thing has to be stewarded in a way that it doesn't become a destructive thing. Yeah. So that, okay. I'm just going to keep going with the next question here because I think it, it tacks on. So another question we had, so these hormones, these urges are natural. So what as a single person do I do um, with those natural urges, with that feeling of being turned on? Um, because, and then that will lead me to ask you, like, what do I do with things like porn and masturbation? Um, and then we'll get back to some of the purity culture stuff. But because we just mentioned the hormones, I really want that. It, that came up so many times for singles in the, this poll. Like, I feel horny. I feel turned on. What do I do with that? <laughs> yeah, it's a big question. You know, there, yeah. there, there is a physiological aspect to this um, mm. where you, you feel that discomfort. Now, let me just say that's a longing. That's an urge. It's not a need. Um, mm. It's the difference between I haven't had water in two days and I have to have water to survive or I'm doing whole 30 and I really crave carbs. So it's like, still feels like an urge. It can still feel um, like it's overtaking your consciousness for short periods of time, but it passes. Yeah. And so the physiological urge um, to have sex um, is really something that we have to say, that's just a small piece of it. Mm -hmm. We can feed that physiological urge by thinking about sex a lot, this is particularly true of women. The more mm. they think about sex, the more their bodies start to get desiring it. They, they mm. produce more of that sex kind of hormone mix that makes you wow. feel that desire. And so some of it is being aware of what am I watching, reading, listening to that is fueling that where I have nowhere mm. to go with it. But mm. I think, Kate, the, the other thing to recognize is that sex feels like a need when we pair it with a legitimate need. Mm. And what I mean by that is a lot of times when you feel this insatiable desire to have sex, you really don't need sex. You're longing for intimacy. 
Mm. Uh, you're lonely. Uh, you feel disconnected. You feel like I'm living in my apartment all by myself. Nobody really knows me. Physical touch, love language yes. people right now. Yes. 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 <laughs> I, or to be noticed. I just yeah. like, I remember talking to this one single woman who just said, I can't get over this desire to have sex. And she talked about how she had just hooked up with a coworker the night before. And she's like, I don't know why I did that. Like I just, I find myself doing this. And so I asked her some questions, you know, was it satisfying you at any level? And she's like, no, like I ended up like crying all night afterwards, but she said in a, and for a moment I felt seen like for a moment, I just felt that skin to skin connection. I felt noticed. And, uh, and so she began to realize that's what I really want. It's not that I want sex. It's not that I want pornography. It's that I have these deeper longings and, um, and we can use sex for comfort. We can use pornography mm. for comfort because of the neurochemicals that are released when we have an orgasm. Yeah. Um, and so we link sex with a legitimate need and then we feel like sex is the need. Mm, okay. So to back that up, when they have that urge, <laughs> it's to pay attention really. Cause like, this is me too. I'm single with everybody else. I'm like, I'm learning too, you guys. I mean, this is so important and things I've been working to practice as well. Personally, as I'm constantly learning on this journey, it's like when I have that urge, I'm not going to shame myself because I think that's really important in our internal dialogue to not be like, Kate, stop that. Like you shouldn't be thinking that, you know, and that's if we should on ourselves, like, right, you shouldn't do that. Like it just, I mean, I, it will downward spiral, get you stuck and you'll probably end up doing that thing, whatever, and thinking about it more, to be honest. Uh Um, That's what happens to me. So instead like, okay, that's normal, natural. Um, What is underneath that for you right now, Kate? Like asking myself, like, is it, are you feeling that way? Cause you just miss a guy that you used to date. Are you, and you, you just long for like a connection with a man um, or you just long for connection, you know, is it, what is that? I mean, in asking ourselves that curiosity questions, is that what you would say would be Absolutely. like the process? Yeah. I, I think that although resisting sexual temptation involves an aspect of self-control, if mm. that is your only strategy, mm that is going to either fail you or you're going to shut down your sexuality, which isn't a good thing. Um, And so uh, mixed with self-control and accountability, you want to have, as you're saying, that curiosity of what is the pattern here? Um, Mm. Do I, do I look at porn when I'm bored because life just feels meaningless? Um, Do I reach out on a sexual chat room or like send pictures to somebody when I just feel inadequate or lonely or after a failure uh, or mm. people that have sexual um, trauma in their past. Yeah. That's another reason is there's almost this unconscious need to reenact uh, mm. some of the trauma that we experience. And so this is why you might find yourself going to the same sort of person who's actually destructive uh, yeah. without like, why do I do this? I know I'm, I've done this before. I always end up hurt, but there's a sense of replaying our trauma. Uh, and so when we talk about sexual desire, mm. It's about so much more than just saying no. It's about really Mm. asking the Lord to begin showing us where do I need healing and Mm. where do I have legitimate needs in my life that aren't being met? And I'm just Mm. using sex as a way to try to scratch that itch. Mm. That is so good. You're bringing up for me too some a question we have later on that I'll just say now because it feels like something that makes so much sense. But at least for me and my journey, um, I have had a lot of sexual trauma in my past. And I found myself having to analyze when I'm dating somebody or um, newly dating, like that I, I'm attaching to um, the sexual dysfunction from a past abusive situation that was basically a blanket for um, – all the other abuse that was happening in my life with that person. And it, in essence, the sexual encounters were also abusive. But it was like the moment I felt disconnected from this person in every way because he was emotionally abusive and physically abusive and all the things that sex was like that Band-Aid. And therefore, I attached to it as something that like – would connect is a connector, you know, um, if that makes sense. Or I felt like, oh, well, that's the way I could feel like he cares about me. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely does. Yeah. So underneath 
all of this and all mm-hmm. of us. And this is why I say we all have sexual brokenness. Our lies we've learned to believe about sex. Yeah. Uh, lies like a guy will only love me if I do this mm-hmm. um, or I've messed up before. And so I'm damaged goods. And so this is all I have to offer. Um, yeah. So, uh, so sh- when we talk about shame, yeah, it, shame is really just the emotion that comes out of believing lies. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, a lot of the work again, of learning to resist sexual temptation is why am I wanting this in the first place? What do I think mm-hmm. it's going to give me? Um, because there's a big fat lie that if you have sex or if you do this, you're going to get this reward when over and over and over again, we learn, no, actually it makes things worse. Um, yeah. but we fall for it in the short term. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's really impactful. And also, just something to continue to process. I feel like if I had a journal right now, I'd be writing that down and be like, I'm going to analyze that later after this <laughs> amazing talk. That's so good, Julie. So to bring it back to um, the purity culture uh, and how we got into this place where we feel a lot of shame, whether it was from a sexual trauma experience or whether it was because of messaging we got from the church and purity culture, uh, how can we kind of deconstruct some of those damaging purity culture messaging that told us that really, you know, told us don't do this, do this, you know, all the legalism. Um, and how do we navigate through that, especially when that messaging is still happening today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You kind of roll your eyes there. You're like, uh, yeah, <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think first of all, like I'm older than you. So I'm sort of like this bridge, uh, of purity culture. Uh, it's kind of a weird thing, but I didn't grow up in it, but I was close enough to it to see it. And yeah. the first thing I want to say is that there were some really good things about the purity message. And some people who are deconstructing from purity culture are throwing out the whole nugget of the purity message, which is that God created sex to be a celebration between the covenant in marriage Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. that God's will for you, the scripture says, is that you remain pure, that you don't involve yourself in sexual immorality. So Mm -hmm. we don't want to throw that out. And I think the yeah, heart behind the people that were teaching the purity message were like, okay, we're living in a world that is just saying, go out and do whatever feels good. And people don't know the negative consequences of that. Um, and so yeah. I, I was there when all this was happening, yeah. but I also recognize that the way some of this messaging was put out made God's design for sex very simplistic. Mm. It made people feel like they were divided into categories of the pure or the impure, which created yeah. either self-righteousness or um, this feeling of God's never going to, I'm on God's plan B, or I'm the donut that's been passed to everybody. No one wants to take a bite out of. That yes. was me. Yeah. I was like, yeah. <laughs> what do I do? Yes. 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 So yeah. you've got that. We've got the fallout of people believing that if I save myself for marriage, sex is going to, first of all, marriage is going to happen. And Mm. second of all, sex is going to be great. And then Mm. either marriage doesn't happen or you get married and you find out that sex is a lot more difficult and painful than you ever imagined it to be. Um, And so you have people deconstructing for that reason. The purity culture did not talk about some of the most important issues like, Mm. uh, like pornography, like LGBTQ yeah. issues. And so, or like sexual abuse, they kind of said, yeah. well, you didn't choose to do that. And so you're really still pure. But in reality, mm. people that have sexual trauma in their past are more likely to act that out in their teen years yeah. um, through compulsive masturbation, through sexual mm. experimentation. And so they're like, yeah, that happened to me, but I still have been with all these people and I still feel like trash. But yeah. I think, Kate, the most important important distinction that we need to make of what the purity narrative or movement did that was harmful was it equated sexual purity with the gospel Mm. and essentially said that your purity comes through your sexual choices Mm. and therefore you're you're going to hell because of your sexual choices or god won't love you and Mm. that's not consistent with what the bible says the bible says that we've all sinned we've all fallen short of the glory of god none of us are pure I mm. saved sex for my wedding night, but I can tell you that I was not sexually pure. And I can tell you that I had a lot of sexual brokenness in my life that I never recognized really until the last decade when I started yeah. studying this. 
Um, And so uh, I had to learn even personally, my purity comes through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Mm. And he sees me just as pure uh, today as he saw me when I was in my Mm. sin uh, because Mm. he saved me out of it. And so I think there's a lot of undoing that the deconstruction that we need to do of, first of all, saying, what did the purity culture get right? And yeah, where have yeah, they really good. complicated this topic? And so that's a lot of the work that I do. And like I said, I don't think it's just for singles. I think everyone in the church needs to return to the question, mm. not only what are the rules of sex, but why did God create those rules? And how can I know the heart of God in those rules? And what does redemption look like? Um, because the truth is we all need redemption. Mm. Okay, you guys, this next sponsor is not a stranger to our show, and I love them so much, so I'm going to keep shouting them from the rooftop. Our next partner is Athletic Greens, and you guys know I take AG1 literally every day. I gave it a try a little over a year ago because I wanted better gut health. I wanted something that increased my energy, that gave me immune support, and I honestly hated taking so many different pills and vitamins because who really wants to take all of that in the morning? right? So right now I take AG1 in the morning before I work out, before I take and make my coffee. And it makes me feel so good. It makes me feel energized. It makes me feel healthy. It does give my immune system a support and it's super, super easy to incorporate into your schedule. Why take so many different things when you can just mix one scoop of powder and water just one time each and every day? So, so, so easy. If you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com forward slash HOD. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash HOD to check it out. Okay, so real talk, I get super motion sickness in the car or on an airplane, all the things. And a few months ago, JJ and I went on a cross-country road trip, and I really needed something to help me with my car nausea. I'm so excited that I actually found a brand that will help you if you're somebody like me that really struggles with motion sickness. You've got to check out Relief Band. Relief Band is the number one FDA cleared anti-nausea wristband that has been clinically proven to quickly relieve and effectively prevent nausea and vomiting associated with motion sickness, anxiety, migraines, hangovers even, motion sickness, chemotherapy, and so much more. Whether you need everyday nausea relief or just an occasional cure from nausea, their patented technology makes feeling sick a thing of the past. Let's go. Forget the days of nausea pills that make you groggy and exhausted. Relief Band is legitimately a band you wear on your wrist to give you relief from nausea, and you can change the intensity depending on how you're feeling to make it stronger or weaker. I can tell you firsthand, Relief Band actually works, and I wish that I had it a few months ago on my road trip cross country with JJ. If you travel and don't bring a relief band with you, you are making a big mistake, let me tell you. We were just in New York City and I was using my phone a ton with Uber and Lyft and this is why you need relief band because you know those moments where you just start getting so nauseous. I love that relief band will give you peace of mind. So if you want the band that actually works at relieving your nausea, check out Relief Band. Right now, we've got an exclusive offer for Heart of Dating listeners. If you go to reliefband.com and use code Heart of Dating, all one word, you'll receive 20% off plus free shipping. So head to R E L I E F B A N D.com and use our promo code Heart of Dating, all one word, to get 20% off plus free shipping. Yeah, it's so interesting because I do feel, and as I've spoken to lots of singles and even pastors, and I'm like, you know, first of all, we really want to try to make this whole sex purity culture, we want it so black and white. <laughs> like, And I think that it's like we, and I remember having a conversation with a pastor recently where I was like, I love that you're trying to make it so black and white. I understand why, but like, I, I just really want to 
implore you that it's more gray than you're trying to make it. <laughs> um, and I think that's part of the issue is that we're trying to make it so like this. And so much about God is more in the gray. Dating is completely in the gray. I mean, like we don't know, like there's a, there's tools, but it's, it's more gray. And how do we allow that space and the, um, give permission for people to be on the journey of understanding that and uh, making it such a way that um, they're really connecting with God in understanding those elements. Uh, for me as well, I often see what the purity culture has done was it put sex on such a, a pedestal or our purity, our sexual nature on such a pedestal in such a way that like that sin is worse than any, that quote unquote sin is worse than any other, right? So it's like, I may be, I sexually engaged with somebody and then, oh my gosh, I was volunteer and they found out I sexually engaged with somebody. So I'm removed from the team. I'm removed from a volunteer team. But meanwhile, the other people who are gossiping or who are doing X, Y, other, other kinds of things, they're not, no, they're fine. You know, do you know what I mean? Like we just, um, have put it on this pedestal. And so now there are these two paradigms, two binaries I see of like either somebody, um, for my example, myself who ha did have a sexual past. I had sex at 16 for the first time and felt so overwhelmed because of all the cultural narratives and my Bible group at the time that I didn't feel like I could share with anyone. I felt I would be rejected. I felt like I had to hide it and that me and this guy had to figure it out together in such a way that we ended up continuing to mess up, you know, mess up because we didn't have a safe place to discuss what was going on. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's individuals who have remained abstinent, but it's become this sort of idol in, and um, maybe righteousness of like, I'm sexually pure. And it's like this amazing thing that I have this like badge of honor in the church because I've remained quote unquote, sexually pure. I don't know if you have any comments at all the stuff I just said. I just am like no, thinking I, out loud I, here. I agree with you. I There are some things in the Bible that are very black and white. Um, and one of them is that God didn't create sex for sexual immorality, for twisted yeah. uses of our sexuality. The yeah. other thing that's black and white is like I said, we all are sinners and we've sinned in many ways. And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether you've gossiped or you slept around, you need Jesus Christ. And he's mm -hmm. the only one that can make you pure. Those things are black and white, but mm -hmm. the gray is, all right, well, what does that mean for me? How do I live that yes. out? Uh, all these gray questions about, am I allowed to do this? And what if I think about this? But you're absolutely right, Kate. Uh, I think we have created within sexuality, this hierarchy of the people that do that right, you know, like didn't have sex outside of marriage, are married, are faithful. Mm. Uh, and we say, okay, they're on the pedestal. And then you, you have like the singles that are struggling, or you have the man who's struggling with pornography. And we're like, oh, okay, that's an issue, but it's not as bad as cheating on your wife. Um, the, the thing is, we all struggle in different ways with this. And if mm. we can create communities where we can admit that, and we together can seek the Lord, I think we'd see a lot less of the silos that are created in the Christian world, as well as we'd see a lot less people having secrets that they don't know where to go for help with. So yeah. there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah. Thank you for just saying that. And just the note on for all the work that needs to be done as you're listening right now, like it's possible to do, it is a journey, you know, but it's such a worthwhile journey because in reading all the responses to this, I'm like, man, I can see how how much even this affects how I today show up just on a first date, you know, because the more I work through some of these narratives, it affects how I think about myself, how I see my body, how I interact with chemistry, flirting. We're going to get into that in a second. And so the doing this work to uncover and go through these layers will inadvertently also just affect your confidence in stepping out and connecting with somebody and allowing for that connection to be rich and um, exciting. And I, I really, it's changed how I show up in dating because of that. So when we, I want to transition into some of that as well now, um, into some dating and relationship things, Julie, because um, now people are like, okay, I'm, I'm doing this work. <laughs> how do I... First of all, how do I go on a date and even flirt? Okay, so I did a separate poll because um, 
the, I think underneath the flirting question is a disconnect from our bodies, to be honest. And it, because when I ask people why they're disconnected from or why they feel awkward flirting, they're like, I just, I don't feel good about myself. I don't feel this. I don't feel, and I believe it's also a disconnect from being connected to our bodies. You can tell me if I'm wrong, but what do you, like, how do people start practicing, you know, they're embracing their sexual desire and their drive in a healthy way? How do they go out there and like bring that to meeting someone of the opposite sex? Because we're really awkward as Christians. We can be really (laughs) awkward. (laughs) We can. Well, let me ask you, how would you define flirting? So, oh, that's a great thing. Okay. So flirting to me is, it's not like this pickup line, you know, it's not like, um, oh, uh, you must've fallen out of the sky because blah, blah, blah. I don't even have a pickup line because I do not do them. (laughs) For me, flirting is a way to just connect with somebody in a way that's showing them that they are seen, heard, loved, valued, and that's playful. So it's, I'm connecting with them and I'm showing them a lot of curiosity and I'm being playful. I'm maybe teasing a little bit. I touch them for a little bit, like a few seconds, you know, making that eye contact, like really showing them you're seen and I'm really interested in you and kind of a fun, curious way. So that's how I would define flirting. (laughs) Okay. So using that definition, would you flirt with uh, a friend or a coworker, um, or are you talking? This is only in a romantic context or potentially romantic context. I, that's so interesting because I guess I would be playful and fun with a friend as well, like a teasing, like you know. But I think when it's with someone of the opposite gender, it's that sexual tension in between you in a way, which isn't bad. Like I think that's what people are afraid of. Like if I flirt, suddenly. They, they're going to think I want to make out with them. I'm like, oh my gosh, why, why is this like, <laughs> why does it have to go th- from zero to 60? I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, I think that this is one of those gray areas, Kate. I think part of it is personality. Yeah. So um, some people just don't have a fun or a playful personality. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, like yeah. it takes a lot for me to get in that fun and pay- playful mode. I, if I want to show somebody that I'm interested in them, I'm going to ask questions and I'm going to listen and be attentive and be empathic. Uh, I'll do that with anyone. Um, So that that's how I would show interest. Even back in the day when I was dating, it was more of, I want to get to know this person. I want to show interest. And I think some people are afraid of sexualizing a relationship. And Mm -hmm. so there's a difference between flirting, like, Hey, I just kind of want to let you know, I'm interested in you. I'd like to get to know you better. And I don't want to be seen as a sexual object. Mm -hmm. Um, And so flirting can have this, it it depends how it's done, but it can have this more overt, uh, I'm into you. um, There's sexual overtones to this. And in our day and age, relationships can get sexual so fast before there's any connection of, hey, we even share the same values or I like your personality. It's just about the physical. And so- you know, I think that there's some healthy pushback to that, but then I mm. also think that there's a sense of if it's out of an un- unhealthy fear or even like you said, body image, like some women yeah. are like, I just cannot ever imagine feeling sexy or attractive to somebody. And so I don't even try the way I dress, the way I, I carry myself. Uh, I, I don't mm. know how to do that. And so I yes. think that there's so many different elements involved in why we flirt and maybe why we're hesitant to do it. I love that. I love the deconstruction. We can't just have black and white answers here today. I'm These sorry. are like you got it's the wrong great. Guess for that. <laughs> so. No, it's perfect. I love. I love it. Make people think about it and how they show up. What flirting means to them. That's like my challenge. What is flirting to you? It's not a one size fit all thing. But also, there's a thing for me that's like, why do you? Why also do you think that if you flirt, it has to be some sort of sexual connotation. Like, um, and so that's my challenge to people. I mean, you can see that in a movie. That doesn't mean that's exactly how you need to show up in that department. That's my yeah, opinion. But, but there, there absolutely are people that, that just sexualize yes. the opposite gender and pornography has done a, a lot for that. And so True. if you're presenting yourself in a flirtatious way, um, there are some people that are just going to take that as, yeah, she wants to go go to bed with me. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think we do have to be careful, especially in today's culture where yeah. we're, we are so prone to objectify each other sexually and mm-hmm. really not get to know each other in other levels of intimacy. 
Yes, that's good. So speaking of getting to know each other and other levels of intimacy, somebody did ask, how can you be intimate without just being physical with somebody that you are dating? Yeah. So intimacy has so many different categories. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I would say that I have an intimate relationship with my 18 year old son. Yeah. It's not, it's not sexual. That Mm -hmm. would be really weird. But yeah. it's, we, you know, we, we know each other. We're comfortable with you. I love him. He loves me. Mm-hmm. Um, I have an intimate relationship with my dad. I have an intimate relationship with friends. Um, and so I think because we define intimacy today as only being sexual, it's mm-hmm. almost like, wait, uh, she's breaking my categories here. Right. Yes. Um, think about like, I think even we see this a lot with same sex attraction. We mm-hmm. mistake the feeling of intimacy and closeness and affection with, well, that must mean it's sexualized. Um, and mm-hmm. so uh, it's important, yeah. I think, to understand that before you ever get married to somebody, they're your brother or sister in Christ. And mm-hmm. the relationship first has to be an intimacy that's growing in. I want to know you. I want to take steps to reveal pieces of who I am and build trust. Uh, I want to do life with you and see how you react in different situations and share like my thoughts on what happened the last few weeks with the, with politics. Like that's a form of intimacy of this is what I'm nervous about. And this is what I think. And here are my ideas. Um, There are a lot of relationships that develop long distance and mm. you're forced to communicate without using your body. Mm-hmm. Um, you're forced to do something like this, do FaceTime. And all you do is talk about your day and talk about what is God teaching you and um, learning to express your feelings. Those are all very important aspects of intimacy and bonding. Mm. And then the physical is supposed to sort of be a growing expression of the spiritual intimacy, the emotional intimacy, yeah. the trust the commitment level. Um, And so in a healthy relationship, those are all growing slowly and consistently together. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, I was recently in a relationship last year and that was a conversation we constantly had, like, what are the buckets we want to focus on in our intimacy department, especially, you know, and, oh, we noticed like spiritually, we're kind of, that bucket is feeling a little more dry. So what do we want to do to grow the spiritual intimacy together as we progress along emotionally checking in on those buckets almost, because like you said, there are different buckets of intimacy and connection that we have with somebody. Um, and we want to steward all the buckets and what, what it can often happen is relationships become physical really quickly. And therefore that physical bucket is like the main bucket you have invested in and you have not been able to see where your intimacy and emotional capacity lands or your friendship connection is or your spiritual connection. And so that's where when I at least coach people, my suggestion is if like some of that can can cloud you in the beginning. So for me, I know that I try my very best. I don't have that kind of physical intimacy, meaning I don't kiss somebody until later on in the relationship. Because for me, if that bucket starts getting filled, my tendency is like, I want to be more, I want, I want that connection more and more and more. I'd rather though first see how are these other buckets panning out? Um, but culture says you need to know if you have sexual chemistry with the person. You need to know if you kiss well with that person. You know, that that's like the cultural, um, secular, uh, argument, I suppose there. So as Christians, when we are dating, um, physical boundaries, all this comes up a lot. And so (laughs) I know we're not going to do anything black and white, but what would be your suggestion for handling the building sexual tension between you and somebody you are growing to really care for and potentially love? Yeah. Well, first of all, if you don't mind, I'd love to go back to something you just said, because I think it's really important. Um, you said it's sort of the cultural push that, Hey, I have to know that we're compatible. There's sexual chemistry, Um, So why would I not have sex with somebody before I got married? Like try before Mm -hmm. you buy kind of thing. Um, And actually the research doesn't support that. Um, The research actually supports that if you don't live together, if you don't sleep together, your marriage has a better chance of surviving. uh, Wow. Um, And part of it is recognizing that you, whoever you marry, if you marry, you will not be sexually compatible. 
Mm. Even if you were like when you're dating, you're like, yeah, we're clicking here. God has designed sex in such a way that if you don't learn to be unselfish and caring mm. and empathic, you wow. will not have a great sex life. And so wow. let me just put that out there. Um, That's great. <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh, and what you said, Kate is really key. Um, the brain chemistry of sex, especially in the beginning of a relationship actually does blind you to being objective, um, the <laughs> dopamine yeah. levels, the oxytocin, yes. it, it is God's beautiful design that when you get married, it gives you sort of that uh, brain chemistry where you're like, I love mm -hmm. being with this person. But if you do it before you get married, it, it keeps you from objectively uh, building intimacy in a way that's grounded in reality. So anyway, yes. I wanted to say all that. And then I'll go back to the question that you asked. It's about. so good. Yeah. 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 That's so, so good. So I think, first of all, we've got to define what is sexual like yeah. what is sexual activity? Because yes, there's physical good. affection, like kissing is not sexual activity, even mm. though it's romantic, it can lead to sexual activity. Um, but sexual activity is really anything that is purposefully stimulating us sexually uh, or mm. expressing uh, and moving towards intercourse. And so yeah. when we get to heavy petting, um, touching yeah. the genital areas, oral sex, that's all sexual activity. Um, and so when people are like, okay, where's that line? The line is anything that, that we would define as being sexual, even if it's outer course, uh, even yeah. if it's touching sexually. And so there are ways to be romantic and express affection uh, that really are, they may be leading you to want to have sex or to be sexual, but they're really not defined as sexual per se. Wow. I think that's like, a big moment right there, Julie. That's like such a big, I think for singles, they're like, really? Because there's so many conversations about around kissing or touching, holding hands, touching of any kind. Like we've have been so, I've dated people who are so uncomfortable that like even touching my hand feels like that's too much. It's going to lead us to everything else. <laughs> and I'm like, just holding hands? Wait, Really? Like, you know, like, so I just wanted to stop and say, that's really, really, I'm so glad that you made that distinction. I'll let you keep going. <laughs> yeah. So, and then I think that there's just wisdom and discernment. And mm. so if you were to say, okay, you know, like, I think I'd be okay in a relationship making out. Don't do it in the first mm. three months of when you met somebody. Yeah. Um, you know, your physical expression should be consistent with other levels of intimacy and also commitment. Yes. And so there's a big difference between a couple that has been dating for two years. They're working towards marriage. They're talking about marriage. Um, they have to, in some ways, have uh, more self-control and setting boundaries because they're like, yeah. hey, we're headed there. Yes. So it's probably not good for us to be alone like after 10 at night because things aren't good things aren't going to happen. But it would be very appropriate for them to long for each other and to hug each other and to kiss each other and to, and mm. to start talking about sex. What would our sex life look like? And um, to be doing some of that work, that's not appropriate when you've been dating for two or three months. Even if you feel in love with that person, mm. you don't have the commitment level. You don't have the history. You don't have the other aspects of intimacy that really say, yeah, it's, it's appropriate to have this, this kind of feeling and affection. Yes, that's so good. Okay, so I think that just helps so many people to really navigate and think about how do I want to enter these conversations with somebody. I, I'll just bring up a personal example, and I will say to to you, Julie, and to everybody, like I'm n I'm not sitting here being like I'm the perfect example of how this is done. <laughs> I'm definitely not. No, I'm, I'm not I'm, either. <laughs> it's a journey. It's a journey, and I'm learning. And you learn so much about yourself through dating. I think that's some of the beauty of dating. Um, but I think what I have seen that's important um, in having those conversations with somebody, because what what happens is everyone's kind of on a different scale of what they what they're used to doing what feels okay for them what they've maybe done what they want to do you know like some people are like i want to kiss on the first date some people are like i want to make out in the first few weeks whatever or on the first date my goodness um and other people are like that's not okay for me so i what I've, i i'm wondering if you have some insight there um because that's been where i've had to navigate those conversations very specifically of 
personally as a single woman being very open in sharing what my boundaries are and what feels good to me um and just being really clear with that so uh and it's not a rejection of the other person it's I really want to be honest with myself, knowing my tendencies, my past, what connects me to somebody, what blinds me from being able to really experience them and get to know them. And for me, I need to set myself up for success in that way. And I'm the only one who knows that personally, you know? And so, but I have found it's so important to find to have those conversations and be on the same page. So any insight that you have um, as couples navigate those conversations? (laughs) What you said is great. I think in today's (laughs) day and age, you do need to have that conversation early in a relationship because Mm. there are expectations, even if somebody is a committed believer, their expectations and their view on this might be very different. Um, Mm. And so I think having that conversation of, Hey, I need, I need to talk with you just about what your expectations are about, uh, where your boundaries are in terms of physical relationship. And I need to let you know what mine are. And, um, and this is again, an area Kate that there, there is some gray and the scripture says that when there's gray, we, we honor each other's consciences. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying, because of my background, I know what my triggers are. Uh, these are the boundaries I need to set and, a a good man is going to respect those in the Mm -hmm. same way. If you're dating a man that, for example, may also have a history um, of maybe pornography or sexual experimentation. And he's like, you know what? I, I want to honor you. And I honestly just can't be alone uh, in a private place with you in a car or, you know, like let's, let's be in public. Let's go to a restaurant. Um, You know, and you're Mm -hmm. like, well, I'd be okay being in a car, but you respect his conviction and you honor the fact that this is an honorable man whose heart is to honor the Lord and protect me. And so uh, I think those conversations are great. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think when somebody has uh, a sexual ethic that is different than yours, Mm -hmm. um, particularly if it's going against the scripture and that shows you where that person's faith is Mm -hmm. and uh, you, you need to know that. And so if this is a conversation that brings that forth, then it's a good conversation to have before you get too involved. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. because that comes down to your values and how, and, and really, you know, yeah, your faith. I mean, that's such a, that's absolutely. So Julie, there's so many other things we can go into. There's more questions, but I want to just throw it to you to say, did we miss something today? There's so many questions that I know you've read them. Did did we miss anything that you want to point out, bring up, share before we close out our time together? Yeah, I hesitate to do it because it's not a fun topic, but I know one of the biggest questions that I get is about masturbation. Yeah. Okay. Do it. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. So very few people want to talk about it, but yeah. uh, but when whenever I speak, we always do anonymous Q and A's, and that question is going to be asked like forty two times. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So do it. I, I share whatever you want to share. Yeah. All right. So, so first of all, let me just say that the Bible doesn't men- mention masturbation at all. And the Bible does go into graphic detail at times of what God defines as sexual immorality. And some yeah. of the things the Bible says we don't like, um, but the Bible does say that fornication is wrong. And that would be having sex with somebody you're not married to. So a single person having sex, adultery is wrong. Orgies are wrong. Uh, There's Mm -hmm. a list of things that God wasn't shy to say, don't do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if God wanted to include masturbation in there, he very well would have and could have. And so we're kind of scratching our heads saying, well, why isn't it even addressed? It's it's not like God didn't know we could masturbate. You know, like the irony there is like- I'm sure it was an issue back then. Um, right. So, yes. uh, so this is not a new question. Um, so for people to uh, just say, well, it's a sin, don't do it. Then I think we border on legalism when we mm. say something is a sin when God hasn't clearly said that. Mm. Um, so I think we need to be careful uh, of piling shame on um, to singles yeah. that are struggling with this topic. Like let's address things that God does call out as sinful. Um, let's, let's address when he says, don't be sleeping around. Don't be looking at pornography. Um, Mm -hmm. but masturbation, uh, is not addressed. And so here's what we do know when something is not specifically addressed in scripture, we want to use principles of wisdom 
to know how to navigate that. Yeah. And there are a lot of, of principles of wisdom. Um, one of the things that I've learned in my work is I think that particularly if masturbation is something obsessive for you, mm. uh, it's most likely a symptom rather than a problem. Yeah. Um, and so, for example, people that have been sexually abused as children, that's those pathways, those neural pathways are established mm -hmm. very early in life. And you learn, this is how I go to sleep, or this is how I comfort myself. Mm -hmm. And so you want to take that as a clue of, Lord, would you show me healthier ways of comforting myself? Um, yeah. So like, that's a principle of wisdom. Or if mm. masturbation is always paired with fantasy or images of pornography, it's the images that we need to address. It's not the act yeah. of masturbation. Um, yeah, and there's, a, there's a lot else I could share with you about um, basically one of the negatives of masturbation, particularly mm. if it's habitual, is that it's training your body to only respond to your touch. Yeah. And so wow. when people get married, they have trouble responding to their spouse's touch. Um, mm. So they have to unlearn that. Um, so those are some of the red flags, I would say, just consider these things. Yes. Um, but I think we need to think more deeply than just slap and shame on it. Uh, instead of just saying, Lord, show me your heart and show me what it looks like to have a healthier perspective of your design for our se for my sexuality. Yes. I think masturbation has become such a taboo subject. I remember when I started my podcast, I had this pastor on and I was like, I'm going to ask him about masturbation. And it was like, for me, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to ask a pastor about masturbation. And it was just like this moment where I was like, okay. And I remember during the interview, if people have listened, it was early on John Mark Homer. And I was like, okay, so I have a question. It's kind of like, it's a big question. I forget exactly what I said, but are you ready for it? He was like, well, now you have me nervous. I mean, what is the question? I'm like, what do you think about masturbation? <laughs> I literally just said it. And he was like, oh, that's totally fine to discuss that. And he just handled it so like, yeah, of course we can talk about it. But I remember being like, oh, I get it. I'm going to ask a pastor about masturbation. We just have this big taboo. Um, and that did show up a lot in our, our questions. I agree. And I'm so glad you brought it up because it's something that I think as singles where, you know, and this is the final thing before we fully close out. I just had this thought earlier because biblically people got married a lot younger. Um, and the, the reality is we're not getting married at, at, for females, we're not getting married at 13 or whatever the average age was, where the average age now is closer to 29 <laughs> um, for, for women. And in cities like I live in LA, that number is higher. So, I mean, basically that age is doubled, if not tripled. <laughs> in ways. And so we weren't um, it wasn't originally designed in the way that we were going to get married this much later. <laughs> so it, I just feel like that's where the ex like expansiveness of these things like masturbation or just our sexual desire, it becomes really, it just becomes more, it's difficult because we are single for that much later. Um, do, do, yeah. Any thoughts about just that, the differences and how biblically people were married young and how we're not anymore. <laughs> and yeah, in fact, if somebody um, was married at 13, we'd be like, whoa. <laughs> you know, right, that would right. Be yeah. But although in the Old Testament, like people were married at like 39 or 40. So, true. you know, I mean, there's examples of that. So yes, it's true. It spans. But I think your point is really true. Not only are we marrying later, but puberty is sooner. Yeah. And the other thing is we live in a very sexualized culture. And so um, our sexuality gets awakened yeah. when we see pornography, when we hear people talking about sex. You cannot watch a TV show or a movie today without explicit sex, yeah. um, without people sleeping around and all the time. You start, mm -hmm. you, so it's just like, that's your normal way of thinking. And, uh, and so you're constantly fighting mm -hmm. against that. And so mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of empathy for singles today because that this is all converging, the early mm. puberty, the late marriage, um, the culture just constantly awakening you, uh, mm. of giving you constant temptation and normalizing yes. that a relationship is sexual before you even know the person. Um, mm. And so I'm glad that you're doing this, Kate, because single Christian mm. singles need to have a community where they're being honest, where they're pursuing truth together. And they're saying, hey, you know, this is tough. We need each other to, uh, to just provide that encouragement. Yeah. So good. Thanks, Julie. And thank you just so much for being on today and really appreciate you sitting down with me and answering 
all of these questions and even my other ad-libbed ones that I threw in today. No, it was great. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And if people want to, you know, connect with you and find out what you're doing and work with you, how do they do that? Because I really want to offer, I, I'm sure, I don't know what your availability is, but, um, you know, I'm, I know you have online things for people, resources, would love to connect them with all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, the website is authenticintimacy.com. And mm -hmm. so we have a weekly podcast called Java with Julie. <laughs> you can find that wherever you get podcasts and we have uh, online groups. Uh, we have a book called Sex and the Single Girl that is specifically for women walking through this. And yeah. um, so other books and online studies. So I would love for you to follow up and just yeah. see how we can encourage you in your journey. The Heart of Dating podcast is created by Kate Warman. It is a part of the Converge Podcast Network. Our incredible editor is the one and only Scott Caro. Our theme music was developed by the amazing Christian Ledoux. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, or if you've never written us a review or ranked us on iTunes, we'd encourage you to do so because it helps us so much to get this podcast into more people's ears. We launch our podcast each and every week on Wednesday. So we'll see you next week. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.